Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Subaru FA20 engine and how it works. Now this particular engine is out of a 2013 Scion FRS and apparently it has rod knock. So we're going to tear this thing down just to see what caused the failure. Now the FA series of engines is one of Subaru's newer designs where it's driven by a timing chain instead of a timing belt. It is a four cylinder horizontally opposed boxer engine. That means you've got two cylinders over on this side here and two cylinders over on this side with the crankshaft down the middle. Taking a quick look around here you've got the plastic intake plenum which is going to spit off air to both sides you got an oil filter on the driver's side nice and easy to access as well as a fill port and you'll see here that there's dual variable valve timing for both the intake at the top here and the exhaust at the bottom here the exhaust manifold actually sits underneath the head over here and goes directly down to the bottom coming around the side here you can see the head and the block is all made of aluminum now the spark plugs are on the side here which are usually pretty tricky on boxer engines because you got the frame sitting right up against you first thing we're gonna do is remove the 12s to get these brackets off Okay, I gotta get some accessories off. Now, no surprise, this engine was made in conjunction with Toyota, which mandated their D4S direct injection and port injection system here. And you can see the direct injectors that go directly into the head over here, and the port injectors that go into the intake plenum over here. And this here is your high pressure fuel pump. Looking at the fuel setup here, we've got low pressure fuel. It's gonna come from the tank over here and over here. This one's gonna go to the high pressure fuel pump, which is gonna pressurize through this pipe over here. And there's a crossover pipe back here for the other side for the direct direct injectors. For the port injectors you got another low pressure hookup that goes directly to the rail over here and then this crossover tube that goes to the rail on the other side of the intake plenum. Now I'm going to go ahead and remove the 12s that hold the intake plenum onto the head and a couple more on this side here. Alright so I should have all the hoses disconnected there. Be able to take that off. I saved you all some time and disconnected the wiring harness so we can take that off. Here you can see is the fuel crossover tube that brings the fuel over to the other side so I'm just going to go ahead and remove that. And move it off this side. It's pretty easy to get off. Now let's remove that crossover tube. That takes high pressure fuel. Here you can see we've got a crossover tube where the two blocks join up to the upper radiator hose. So I'm going to remove that next. And remove that. Now the front of the engine is one accessory drive that drives the crank. A bunch of these little pulleys here as well as that water pump. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that. I can imagine the alternator and AC compressor was also situated up here. Still using plastic pulleys on these. And this one's metal. All right, let's remove this high pressure fuel pump. Yeah. That snapped up pretty hard there. That's because there's a giant spring in there. So if you take a look at how this works, there's a big spring in here, just like a valve spring. And inside of here, there's a cam loop that pushes it up and down. And that's what's going to pressurize the fuel. I'll just remove the flange here for that high pressure fuel pump. Someone's resealed this at some point. There's way too much RTV on here. And this is the roller here that rides up against that cam loop. Well, that engine looks pretty clean inside. It only had 114,000 kilometers on it. This valve cover is interesting. It's got a bunch of 10s holding a smaller cover on and then a bunch of 12s holding the outer cover on. So let's just knock the smaller one out first. You can only imagine doing this job while you're in the car and up against the frame rail. That's a clean engine. Kind of sad that it failed. Let's take off the valve cover on the right side here. Again, pretty clean inside of there. Now the dual overhead cams are secured by this entire cam cradle going all the way around. And then there's also these cam caps. In order to get that off, we gotta get the timing cover off. So let's go there next. Start with this pulley here at the front. Now I cheated and I knocked this bolt free when the flywheel was on there. Next I'm gonna get the dipstick. It's kinda like that brother-in-law that won't go away. Kinda stuck in there and doesn't wanna come out. There we go. Let's gonna remove this idler pulley assembly. Next I'm going to remove the variable valve timing solenoids. Yeah, these kind of act like a plunger when you apply electricity. Get the solenoids on the passenger side here. Next up I'm going to tackle the timing cover. Now these are all held in by 12 millimeter bolts going all the way around. Luckily this engine sits longitudinally so if you had to do any timing work you just have to remove the radiator in the front end of the vehicle to gain access. All right, let's see if I can pry this timing cover off. That's one massive timing cover. The one thing I don't like about this timing cover design is that you've got the oil filter, which has to take a main oil galley right through this interface here. Timing covers are known to leak, and if you have that leaking there, that could cause a big problem because you'll lose oil pressure. Another thing I can see here is that there's actually bits of metal in here, which is not good. This looks like it's probably bearing material, and it's kind of sludgy at the bottom here, so 
doesn't look good for the health of this engine. Taking a look inside of the FA20 engine, you can see there's two timing chain setups, one at the front here for the right bank and one at the back here for the left bank. You can see that you're using plastic timing chain slides, which I don't really like. Overall, it is a pretty simple setup, just crank to cam, very simple. There's no extra pulleys or anything in the way. Another thing to note is you can see this is actually a trigger wheel for the cam position sensor for the intake and exhaust that sat on the timing cover. All right, I'm gonna start removing this chain tensioner. And we'll move this guy here. We can take off the chain, take the chain off. I'll remove the tensioner on this side. Gotta be careful there. That thing's got a lot of spring force. Pull this guy out. This gear should pull off. There we go. Let's pop this hex off here. Next up, I'm going to remove all the 12 millimeter bolts holding these cam caps as well as this entire cam cradle on so we can work on this head. Here's the cam cap. Whoa, that kind of looks worn out in there. So does the camshaft. Some of the rockers are coming out as well. Whoa. Yeah, this stuff looks worn. I feel like this engine might have been oil starved. See if I can get these direct injectors off here. Whoa, that's a lot of fuel. This fuel rail feels really heavy. So that was actually the upper portion. There's a lower portion over here. There we go. So you got a lower portion here that strengthens things up but it also gives you another interface where these oil passages can leak. Now the head bolts on these are a 14 millimeter 12 point socket. All right now I'm going to zip these off. Now I'm going to go ahead and remove this head here. It's so small eh? Whoa there's a lot of carbon in there. Let's take a look at that head gasket. Well, this head gasket is so thin. Multi-layer steel, just two layers. Looking inside of there, it does look a little dark, but they're not really broken yet. Moving over to the passenger side, we're going to go ahead and remove the cam caps. And over on this side, we do have a vacuum pump. I'll just remove the 12s, holding it on. There you go, you can see it's driven off of the intake camshaft on the passenger side. You can hear it makes farting sounds. All right, let's get this cab shaft out of here. Here's your cam covers. This one's not nearly as score. Cam shaft is in better shape than the driver's side. Same with the bearings. Cam shaft is in better shape on this side. I'm going to take off the cam cover base. We got the direct injected fuel rail. Seems like everything on this thing is a 12. Whoa, gasoline. All right, now we're going to get the head bolts on the passenger side here. I like how these are nice and easy to access. Unlike some German cars, where you have to get with a really deep, long socket. It's also a very common socket being a 12 point. Not some weird torques or spline or anything. All right, now we're going to zip these off. Pull off the head. I thought Subaru would have been tortured from their head gasket history. This head gasket is also pretty thin, it's just two layers of steel. They're also using a really large open deck design here, I can push my fingers right through and that's because there's actually bolt heads that bolt all the way to the other side because this block is actually made of two halves. Next I'm going to work on this water pump, it's a bunch of 10s going all the way around. Whoa, very simple water pump, very small and at least it's not chain driven unlike the H6 water pump. My gasket has seen better days. Let's remove this little block off plate here. Is that part of the PCV system? It doesn't seem to block off much at all. So now that I've got the engine all stripped down, I'm going to go ahead and turn the block over so we can access the oil pan. Underneath here we got a stamped steel lower oil pan, so I'm going to go ahead and remove the 10 millimeter bolts that hold it on. The Toyota did not build in any pry points, so we're going to have to just pry this until I can get it off. There we are. Oh, check out the stink inside of there. Take a look at all the connecting rod bearing material inside of there as well as the sludge buildup. You can definitely tell they ran this low on oil. All that flaky stuff is bearing material. I'm going to remove the two tens for this pickup tube. Here you can see that pickup tube's got a little bit of debris inside of there. Next up we're going to take off the upper portion of this oil pan is bolted to the block. It's a bunch of 12 millimeters going all the way around. Go ahead and pry that up. Interesting assembly there. You got coolant flowing in through here. 
and oil flowing on this side. So I didn't even realize that this engine's actually locked up. And if you look down in here, this connecting rod's getting a little dark. And this one's the darkest. I think this is the one that has a bearing that's chewed up, given that there's carnage inside of the block over there from when it scraped the block. Now this looks like a spline drive, but I'm going to try an E-Torx 14 socket. See if I can get these connecting rod caps to loosen up. I'm going to zip these guys off. Here's the connecting rod cap. You can see there's a lot of lines on it. You see there is a bearing that exists on here. Let's take this one off here. Whoa, you can see that's chewed up. And there's a lot of small fragments on here as well. This bearing is also spun around. So this is actually spun two bearings. So here's a closer look at those bearings. Here you can see this one here. Looks like it's almost spun. It's all mashed up and kind of have a lot of lines on it. But in this case here, you can clearly see where the bearings spun around. Basically it has two halves and that half slipped over this half because of all the heat and lack of lubrication. And you can see this one's actually stuck to the connecting rod. Alright, so here I popped off this connecting rod. You can see the bearing is all chewed up. That's what the piston looks like. And number three here doesn't look any better. See it also has a lot of burn marks from all the heat that built up on it. And this here is what's left of that spun over connecting rod bearing that I fished up. As far as I can tell, this crankshaft is still stuck. So I'm gonna have to do a little bit of beating to try to get this thing apart all right so i found once i put all the timing components in the front here i can rotate the engine barely it's still so stiff but at least i can get it up to where i can remove the connecting rod bearings for the piston number one all right this one looks better this one looks like it was about to go it was pretty much heating up pop out these pistons here you can see this one was definitely heating up and the one on the front actually fared the best there was not that much heat applied to it now given that the crankshaft still is really stiff to move with no connecting rods in it pretty sure the main bearing should have some damage as well from this lack of lubrication now because this is a boxer engine and we've got two cylinders on either side the block is actually split down the middle to allow the crankshaft to be inserted so there's a bunch of bolts going down below the head surface here which will bolt the halves together these are a 12.12 millimeter socket i'm going to go ahead and break them free now just go ahead and wind those bolts out Gotta rotate this thing back over. Probably make more mass because there's actually more bolts at the top here. A couple more 12s and then we can split her open right down the middle. All right, I hope this is not too heavy. Okay, not too bad. I'm gonna go ahead and split this block. And we split it open. And there you see the crankshaft in between. Ow! Oh, that hit my foot hard. And crankshaft's just such a little guy for a four-cylinder. It's really compact. Rear main seal also fell out here, as well as the thrust bearing at the back. Boy, these are in rough shape. So we've got the engine all torn apart here. Let's take a quick look at how it works and why it failed. Now we're going to start at the bottom here where of course we have that debris in the oil pan that we saw earlier and the oil pickup tube which you can see the screen here is all clogged up with particles. I also like how they have these drain back tubes that bring the oil right back down to where the pickup tube is situated as opposed to just falling down due to gravity. Of course this being a boxer engine oil doesn't just find its way down to the middle point because it is a sideways engine. Now oil from that pickup tube is going to come directly to this upper oil pan here which is kind of a weird contraption. The oil is then going to be sent directly to the timing cover at the top here that interface and then back into the block. Now on this side is worthy to know the lower radiator hose and the thermostat connects here right behind the water pump. And the water pump is serpentine belt driven as opposed to timing chain driven so you can change that out easily. Now oil is then going to make its way through this timing cover where we have the oil pump directly driven off of the crankshaft over here. That's going to generate oil fluid flow and then it's going to send it out through this galley over here to get filtered out and then send back in through this hole here directly into the engine block. Now one thing I don't like about this design is that you've got a number of interfaces here that could potentially leak causing a reduction in oil pressure. Now that oil is going to be sent straight down to this main galley which runs the length of the block here to lubricate the entire crankshaft assembly through these little holes over here that are drilled in to tap to them. And one thing I don't see is any internal piston squirters to line the cylinders with oil. And then we come to the main victim here which is the crankshaft. You can see just how that connecting rod spun around over here and that's due to the lack of lubrication and heat which just causes so much friction and then it just decides to spin. You can see just how worn out these bearings are. You can see the other bits of bearings here are also a testament to how much heat and lack of lubrication happens when you starve your engine with oil. Now the layout of this crankshaft is very similar to many other four cylinder crankshafts where you have five main bearings and the one and four are opposing the two and three. However, this one is a lot more compact because the cylinders are opposing each other so you have a lot more spaces on the side as opposed to having them all in line which means it would be a longer crankshaft. 
And that's why this crankshaft looks nice and cute. And now of course the main bearings on the crankshaft also lubricate the connecting rod bearings through these little holes over here that tap off for the oil. And you can see when it doesn't get enough oil just what happens. This thing is just so crusty and it's just heated up. You can see all the black heat marks around here. And of course the damage that was done. This engine was pretty seized up when I got it. That's because it just does not want to turn anymore. I kind of find it cool how the wrist pin is offset from the connecting rod by design. Now an interesting thing is these engines are known to burn oil. However, this particular one doesn't seem like it was burning oil because the oil control ring here is absolutely clean. I don't see that much carbon deposits on the inside here. Of course, the top does have that black staining and that interesting shape for the direct injectors. So that really points to the stupid person who was maintaining this vehicle that simply couldn't pull out a dipstick. It's kind of sad that this would happen because dipsticks are one of the easiest things to pull out especially when you compare it to pulling out other things. Come to think of it, this was actually a very low mileage failure. You could see most of the damage here was pretty much restricted to the bearings themselves. Underneath here, things do look okay. This block can probably be salvaged. Furthermore, if you look inside of the bores here, I don't notice there's any scoring or any marking or rust buildup. Now taking a look under the head here, now let's not make any Subaru head gasket jokes because supposedly they fixed that issue. Here you can see the direct injectors that are going to directly inject gasoline inside of here. That's great for power as well as fuel efficiency because you can monitor exactly how much fuel goes into the combustion chamber. Now looking over here at the block you can see they are using an open deck design and that's great for cooling but it's not very good for too much power because you won't have too much support in between here. You can also see there's a lot of room over here for cooling so you probably know that these engines are not going to overheat as much as the last ones did. Now oil lubrication for the head is actually coming from the timing cover here. You can see this is where it would input into this oil galley and then be sent up to these two galleys that run along the length over here. Now looking across the top here you can see these two oil galleys are going to provide oil pressure to these hydraulic lifters. Now this little rocker arm sits on top of the valve as well as the hydraulic lifter and then the camshaft acts upon this little roller. Now because this engine sits sideways, let's say if your valve clearance is off or let's say the camshaft is in the opposite position or the valve sticks, at some point you might have a little bit of clearance between this roller and the camshaft and this thing could just pop right off. There's nothing really holding it on and this sits sideways so it's just going to pop off and sit down inside of the head. Now that could potentially be an issue that could mess up your engine. As you can see here there's nothing holding these together unlike other engines where there might be like a retention mechanism. Finally valve springs were a very common issue on these early engines where they would fail. So if a valve spring for example if it collapses well that would allow the valve to be sent down into the engine and then it would cause collateral damage between the piston and the valves colliding. Now Toyota and Subaru did extend the warranty on some of these to help out some customers but I think that's long gone by now. Now sitting on top of this head here you can see there are more oil points here is this cam cradle which is where the camshaft sits in. And you can see those holes there were to lubricate the camshafts themselves. In terms of the air intake, there's not much to see here. There aren't any mixing flaps or anything. But here you can see the little tips of the port injectors that sit right on top of it. Now these scrap Subaru engines make some really nice coffee tables because they sit nice and low. And this is the first one that I've torn down that has a chain. So let me know if you'd like me to make one and post a picture. And there's a look inside of the FA20 engine and how it works. As for any engine, please make sure you check your oil so this doesn't happen to you. And subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.